Thank you for being with us. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council, and I'm delighted to welcome you here today for the United States and Global Missile Defense Conference, hosted by our Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security. I'd also like to welcome, uh, offer a special welcome to all of those who are tuned in watching us online and encourage all of you to join the conversation throughout the course of the day using, uh, via Twitter using the hashtag ACDefense. This annual Missile Defense Conference has become an important part of the Council's body of work, almost our landscape. It spans the spectrum of the Atlantic Council's engagement on critical global issues, particularly those concerning national defense and America's interest and our relationships in Europe, the Gulf, and Asia. We're most grateful to Raytheon, the sole sponsor of this series, which we launched together uh, more than six years ago as we were talking about this morning. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us as partners in this endeavor. Um, over these years, we've been tracking closely the growing importance and increasing urgency of missile defense. It's an increasingly important part of our military operations and deterrence. From a military perspective, the proliferation of ballistic missile def missiles with ever greater range, speed, accuracy, and usability has made them an increasingly present lethal reality on the battlefield. And the absence of missile defense capability can degrade both the performance and the safety of our soldiers, sailors, marine, marines, and airmen. So this, in, in this age of ballistic missile defense proliferation, missile defense is also critical to deterrence. And for these reasons, it's very much a priority for America's most important security relationships and our alliances. And hence, that's the focus of our conference today on the United States' efforts to promote and foster regional missile defense collaboration. Global relevance of missile defense has just been underscored if you've watched events in the past few weeks. Uh, here uh, in May, President Obama, if you think about the Gulf, hosted the Gulf Cooperation Council Summit at Camp David, whose focus included a vision at the time for a regional missile defense architecture. And just days later, on June 6, we saw a Saudi Patriot missile system shoot down a Scud fired from across the border in Yemen, further underscoring the relevance of that agenda. If you think about Europe today, Russia's violation of the INF Treaty, its deployments of new medium range ballistic missile systems, and its menacing bravado about the use of nuclear weapons makes missile defense all the more relevant to European security today, unfortunately. And in Asia, concerns about ballistic missile defense, uh, missile threats um, from North Korea's continued efforts to upgrade and expand its arsenal of ballistic missiles uh, also dri driven by China's buildup of ballistic missiles and its aggressive actions in the South China Sea and elsewhere have moved this issue front and center in the Asia Pacific. And here in the United States, while there's now a strong bipartisan consensus that exists in support of missile defense to protect the homeland, debate continues over the robustness of our capabilities, including the interceptors, numbers, sensor capabilities, coverage, uh, and whether, uh, including proposals for East, uh, East Coast onshore and offshore launch capabilities. So our conference today is going to cover the range of these issues um, and features a fantastic lineup of speakers. We're really looking forward to this. We'll kick off shortly with remarks and a conversation with General Cartwright uh, on U.S. missile defense plans and priorities. We'll follow that with a panel discussion on transatlantic missile defense architecture, defining the right threat set. Then we'll turn to defense cooperation in the Arabian Gulf. How far can we go? followed by a keynote from one of our friends and colleagues, Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Brian McKeon, on missile defense collaboration in an age of turmoil. And we'll follow that with a panel discussion on missile defense in the Asia Pacific. We'll conclude the conference today by looking forward, thinking about ensuring effective missile defenses in the future to address the technology and programmatic challenges and opportunities that are likely to shape missile defense in the years ahead. So before I turn to my colleague, Barry Pavel, to the Vice President and Director of the Scowcroft Center, who will introduce uh, General Cartwright more appropriately, um, let me just say, once again reiterate our gratitude to Raytheon for its support. Thank all of you uh, for joining us for this, uh, this conference throughout the day, and especially to our speakers, some who have traveled uh, from long distances to share their time and thought leadership on this important topic. And a shout out to Barry, to Ian Brzezinski, uh, Parajita, Robbie, and uh, the colleagues that really helped put this together today. Barry, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Damon. And I wanted to add my thanks to Raytheon and to uh, our speakers and to all of you, because we're, we're going to engage in a conversation. Um, uh, 
throughout, throughout the whole day. Um, our morning keynote is very well known uh, in the Washington national security community. General Cartwright is currently the Harold Brown Chair at CSIS, but he holds a lot of other uh, titles and does a lot of other things. And um, uh, I've known General Cartwright for quite a long time. I probably won't mention the, the year that we first met, um, but it's been a while. And I've found consistently he's always ahead of the pack. He's always looking forward, and Damon said the last panel will, will look forward, but I have no doubt that you will, we will come away from this next conversation with a very different sense of where missile defense is headed, what its roles are, and what the future possibilities, possibilities may be. Um, unique among Marines, General Cartwright served as commander of Strategic Command, another example of how his uh, advice and expertise were valued by senior leadership in the Pentagon and in the White House. Um, and that was right before he was nominated and appointed as the eighth vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the second uh, uh, highest military officer in the nation. And, and I know from firsthand experience that he was enormously valuable in helping uh, the Bush administration and the Obama administration on a very, very wide range of military uh, security and foreign policy issues his visionary thinking on global security trends, and keen interest and understanding of new technologies have always provided a very fresh perspective, and as I said, always on the leading edge of thinking and looking ahead at what's coming next and not looking behind. So I think I want to maximize my time with him and your time with him, so I am now going to pass the floor to General Cartwright. We'll hear from him, and then we'll have a great conversation with him. With him. General Cartwright. If that's okay. You can do whatever okay. you want. <laughs> um. I, they gave me 10 minutes here, and so um, I thought kind of looking at uh, what the trends are, um, as particularly now sitting on the outside looking in, uh, what, what is likely to come down the path on a global <clears throat> scale, what is working, what is not working, things like that. And I usually try to do three things, because that's as high as a Marine can count, but I've got four, so that's why I have a note um, to remind me here. But um, I think you know, the, one of the first things that, um, that we have seen uh, in this area of missile defense is um, if you go back into the 90s and even the early 2000s, the bulk of what we were trying to deal with were ballistic trajectories, you know, basic arc, minimum energy, throw it out there as far as it would go, and somehow it would hit the ground. Uh, and, and hopefully in the same you know, target grid, but usually pretty random as to where they came down. Um, that, ha that, that level of expertise by a nation state is still out there in some countries, but now you're starting to deal with maneuvering um, activities, with precision activities, um, that are fundamentally changing the game on how we go after these uh, capabilities. And so this introduction of mobility on the ground, so in other words, the launch site is mobile, mobility on the targeting, in other words, you can adjust in flight and move around aerodynamically in the atmosphere with some expert, uh, expectation of either a, uh, a near hit or a precise hit, depending on your level of technology, have started to change the game. The other thing in the game is more and more countries basically thinking along the lines of raids. So in other words, overwhelming the defenses uh, type of approach uh, and, and starting to think about the tactics that are necessary and the capabilities necessary to do that. Um, and you'll see this in, in several places uh, you know, around the world as we start to look at that. So the, the landscape has started to change from a pure ballistic activity to one that is far more difficult and far more precise, and therefore the threat is, is increased for each, each launch and each uh, defense. The, um, the other side of this equation is the reality that has come to pass that um, from tactical to strategic, we have to worry about it all. And so you may have to worry about rockets and decide that even though the rocket probably costs less than 20 bucks, you're going to use something like Iron Dome against it. 
um, to go after it because you have to protect your population. You cannot just sit on your hands. And so that, that imperative, which heretofore was thought more in the context of war, the ability to protect your population has become a political imperative in many countries. It just can't be ignored. And that imperative has generated the need and the willingness to pay at premium price for capabilities to defend the population. Okay, those you know rockets, uh, you know smaller type of projectiles, don't necessarily represent something that would conquer a, com a country, but they certainly represent something that would undermine the governance of the country if they get through and if they happen too often. And so they're realities that you you just have to deal with them. More and more countries are trying to get into the strategic business, the ICBM business, um, the long range type stuff to hold people at risk, particularly uh, the United States. Um, and so that, that target set, so to speak, that capability is starting to grow um, and will continue to grow uh, as best we can see it looking out into the future. Um, the third area um, is this idea of pacing the threat. Um, this is a defensive system, and so most countries wait for an imperative, a need that, they, that is actual, not imagined or projected, and then they try to basically field at a rate that matches that, not spending any more money than they have to, to get some level of deterrence and capability. Um, that element starts to bring in, and I, in, in the introduction it was mentioned also, this idea of deterrence. Um, if, you are, if you are a country that is proposing to hit your neighbor or someone else with, with missiles, um, you're likely to have to think twice and change your risk calculus if your adversary has any kind of defensive system. Whether the press believes it works or not, <laughs> you have to take it into your calculation. I mean, it's just a reality. And so it has become, missile defense has become a key element in deterrence and for the United States in extended deterrence. And that's a concept that we haven't yet fully embraced, but is very real to those who are using it. Um, there's a difference between I promise that I will come if you need me and you have your own defensive systems. <laughs> I mean, it, it, there, is a, there is a calculus and a psychology there that, that plays to deterrence that um, is starting to emerge as a very powerful element of strategic deterrence. And then on the strategic side, the idea now, the thought process as you look at this, that um, the, more, the more people work on, the countries work on these systems other than Russia and the United States, the more sophisticated they become in their ability to handle threats, to handle, you know, to have capabilities that will defeat existing capabilities on the other side. Whether it's maneuvering, whether it is all sorts of protective devices on the missiles or the warheads, et cetera, all of these things are starting to emerge on the high technology side for those nation states that are mature in this game. I mean, it's just, it's just a reality that we have to deal with. And then the fourth point I thought that, that's important as you look at the trends here, uh, between the Bush administration and the Obama administration, um, and it really started in the Bush, but it, but it was really played out in the Obama administration, is this transition from the strategic missile defense, the national protection, to regional constructs. And those regional constructs are very important in their character. Um, I would say that if you were to ask uh, the man on the street, um, and if they were lucky enough to know something about missile defense, the European system, so to speak, architecture, is what most people know about, okay? But the attributes that you're looking for, one is pacing the threat, two is actually having something that addresses the threat that's actually there, not one that's imagined or, or forecast. And the idea that that threat could go all the way from rockets to ICBMs with nuclear warheads, and you have to cover that entire range, means that the adaptive side of this equation has become extremely important. 
um, as you see the character of the threat that Europe is trying to address as you bring in the, the challenges that the speaker, uh, the introducing uh, person talked about was, you know, what do you do about a Russia? What do you do about, you know, their intermediate range and short range capabilities and their sophistication? Does that change the architecture for Europe? Does it start to change the thought process about how you address that? All of those are valid questions now that have to be asked. But imagine yourself in a world where Europe decided 10 years ago that they were going to go gangbusters all out and buy phased adaptive approach. Would they be in the right place today? How much money would have been expended that wouldn't, wasn't necessary to have expended? I mean, these are all questions that you have that the question is now, how quickly can we adapt? What are the things that people envision they would do differently now having an emergent different threat than, than what was forecast? Those kinds of questions are really important, number one. Number two, which I think is actually more important, is the architectures that have been envisioned for regional defenses are architectures that no one country can either afford or geographically base in a way that's completely effective to protect their country. In other words, they endear alliances. Okay? They endear the investment of alliances, and they find that they make allies among people who historically have not been necessarily close allies. You can see that in the Middle East. You're going to have to see it if it's going to be successful in the Pacific as it starts to emerge. NATO was picked kind of as the primary talking point a few years back with phased adaptive approach because the alliance was already there. But what it has done in places like the Middle East and the Pacific in building alliances that heretofore really found no reason to emerge has been quite interesting and, and continues to be interesting as we, start to fa as we start to field advanced capabilities associated with the threats in those regions. So I think that's, that's something that's really important to, to get at. And then this concept in policy of is extended deterrence only about nukes? And I think it's time to start to set that aside as an interesting way to think about it in the past. But the reality of the breadth and depth of the threat and the capabilities that defensive systems have been able to bring to the table are going to change the concept of, or should change the concept of extended deterrence and how we think about it okay. and the burden sharing that comes with that. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop at that point. Great. Well, you certainly gave us enough, General Cartwright, to. Uh... Uh, discuss, and especially that last point I think is very interesting, that extended deterrence uh, should, should have many facets going forward. Um, I wanted to uh, address um, your, your comment about Europe and just delve into that a little bit more. The, you and I were involved in the development, when we were in government, the development of the, of the phased adaptive approach, and I see General O'Reilly sitting here <laughs> in the second row, who was uh, central uh, to that architecture, and that architecture was focused um, focused NATO's missile defenses on the possibility of a threat, of a growing threat from Iran. The phases uh, were increasing ranges to deal with increasing uh, projected ranges of Iranian ballistic missiles. We have a, a, a nuclear deal deadline next week. Um, but we also now have a very different security environment than when you and I were in government in Europe. It's, a, it's, a, it's an insecure region now. We have a very restive Russia, nuclear saber rattling, snap exercises, uh, a very active and, and threatening environment to many of, uh, of our NATO allies. How should we think about missile defense for NATO? We have this, in some ways, a down payment of a phased adaptive approach really um, focused on the uh, threat from a small arsenal coming from the Middle East. Uh, 2015 is the year when phase two is supposed to go into effect with uh, a new site to be completed in Romania, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And then in uh, a couple of years, a third uh, additional site in Poland uh, for the SM-32A, as I recall, a, a more, much more capable missile interceptor than the, the, the ones that are currently fielded. How should we think about this architecture regarding the threat from Russia at multiple levels? Um, you could do multiple theses on this and, and uh, <laughs> still probably not cover it all. 
Um, I think at the attribute level, um, there are a couple things that we have to think about when you bring a sophisticated actor like Russia into that equation of what had been envisioned as phased adaptive approach. And already you have seen on the adaptive side changes in the architecture from what it was originally envisioned to be. Um, changes in the types of missiles that we put into Europe, changes in the thought process associated with the sensor grids and the command and control, all of those things have been allowed to mature as technologies either prove themselves or disprove themselves you know, in both cases. Um, and that will, that will be the case. The difficulty here is you're increasing the breadth of the threat, the different diversity of the threat out there. You cannot just forget about the Middle East. Um, so you have, to, you have to keep something that's capable of that. You have to keep a sensor grid that's capable of seeing all of those types of things. And you have to start to think about the strategic side of, um, of Russia and their, their capability. And you know, from my own just belief on this, um, a little bit of what will have to happen uh, is that you'll have to take a look at what, what kinds of threats will come out of Russia, um, what, what you imagine will happen there, how will you discover those threats, in other words, what's the sensor grid look like to see that, um, how much decision time can you actually put in, and you're almost in a point of transition here. We had gotten to a point, particularly in the SM-3 missile, the Navy missile, and the, the two series of it, where we increased the size of the motor to get more energetics, to get more keep, uh, what we call keep out range, things like that. And, and we stopped at a certain point, and right now I think 2B has been shelved mm -hmm. to a large extent. Um, and the question becomes, are we going to have to have something similar to that in order to keep missiles out of, not only from not hitting a city, but out of, the, of Europe? That architectural question will create, uh, as it did before, strategic instability between Russia and, and the rest of the world. Um, uh, Russia is very concerned about the technologies associated with missile defense, about what it does to the balance, the strategic balance in the world, and what it does to the strategic balance in the region. And all of those questions are going to come into play. And so now you start to look at that. Missile defense in and of itself and the way it's been architected is also, should also be significantly impacted by the third offset strategy. So, you know, if you are using Iron Dome to shoot down you know, rockets that cost pennies on the dollar compared to the cost of an Iron Dome round, you're going to run out of resources at some point if you're dealing with raids. So there has to be a way to solve two problems. One is numbers and keep out distance. And the second one is how do I start to get at these assets and keep them from ever even entering our airspace? And that's the issue with the bigger motors. We had for, one, for quite a while in missile defense looked at a much larger uh, capability, energetics to get out further, to get it hopefully intercepting in the boost or the ascent phase. That was given up as too costly, um, and I think that's right. But the third offset strategy has made pretty strong recommendations uh, in, in four general areas, cyber, um, uh, EMP, and um, directed energy, and the electric or the rail guns. Um, and you look at those four technologies and they, they fundamentally shift the cost equation. Are they ready today? Not, not for a sophisticated threat, but they have substantial upside potential and something that moves at the speed of light and has a reasonably lim uh, unlimited magazine starts to really change the calculus and becomes extremely destabilizing. So the question is, do you then create a new barter, a, a new deal? Uh, about stability and how you're going to treat it. Do you enter into a conversation with nations that are capable of those types of weapons um, at some point in time and other nations and you start to say, okay, this is how we're going to handle this. Um, you could see that happening in, you know, in the 2020, 2025 time frame as being an area where we would start to think. The current New START treaty um, by design and with intent in the, in the um, 
the front end of this thing, the preface side of the equation, not binding, has a discussion about hypersonics, a discussion about um, these so-called speed of light weapons, directed energy, things like that. Um, because both countries know the reality is that those are going to be significantly destabilizing as we start to move to the future and, and how we're going to handle them. And it just forces us to start to think about them. That's a long answer. but No, it's great. You answered my second question without me <laughs> asking it, but I want, I want to ask it anyway and, and sort of get it, get it, delve into this area because I think it's the most interesting and underappreciated in the entire um, debate on missile defenses, and that is coming within a 10-year time frame, roughly, are potentially a set of technologies, and you mentioned them, that, um, you know, to bring it down to attributes, make missile defense capabilities much more numerous, much uh, less expensive, uh, much more mobile. And um, the questions that it raises, I think, for the uh, classic nuclear balances between the United States and Russia, and certainly between, uh, uh, in, in however one would characterize the relationship between the United States and China, uh, and other impacts. I think there are enormous questions that I think it's policy debates like this should should try to get ahead of it. And so you you do see this as potentially destabilizing. And wh what else might you? Uh, how else could we sort of discuss and debate the the likelihood of this? I mean, are all those capabilities coming? Definitely. And if so, what does it mean for just the the basic premises of how we discuss nuclear deterrence, extended deterrence? and the role of missile defense in policy. Um, Another thesis. Yeah. Uh, I, in, you know, my, my sense is, for what it's worth, is that the defensive side of the equation was significantly underplayed through most of the nuclear age, so to speak, through the Cold War. Um, it was all about, really, offense. And Reagan had this vision um, it's not really what missile defense has turned out to be, but it was a vision of a different balance of offense and defense. And, and the ability to build it on a global scale. I think what, where we are today, regional has emerged as a, as a more practical approach than a global approach. Um, the regional capabilities are so different and disparate and the threats are so different that it has to be tailored at a regional level almost um, uh, any way you look at it. Uh, but as you look at these new technologies, um, the issues become the vulnerabilities or the ability to, to, to basically conduct conflict at, you know, at the slow end for rail guns at hypersonic speeds and at the high end speed of light. Um, and, and start to think about that. And none of these technologies, quite frankly, are ready for prime time today. But they all have realistic, substantial upside potential. Uh, some of them are limited by power management. Some of them are limited by computational power. I mean, all sorts of different things, but all areas where there are significant breakthroughs occurring on a regular basis. And so they are all upside. The idea like that we have seen similar in cyber where availability, affordability, all of these equations, access to is at a level where it is almost globally spread. In other words, you don't even need to be a nation state. So you have to start to think about it in a fundamentally different way. Um, the idea of an offset strategy is an, is a, is an idea that says that uh, I don't know, I use Air Force terms, when we went to precision as an offset strategy, it was the idea of how many passes, how many airplanes had to fly over the target and drop bombs in order to destroy it, to how many targets you could fly over with un one airplane and destroy each one of them. You know, yeah. this is an idea of, in the offset strategy, of can I get the cost of a round from hundreds of thousands down to below a dollar? And, and that doesn't look at the R&D, it doesn't look at any of the other, but, but every shot, and, and can I make my magazine unlimited in, in, in some essence? You're not there today, but that's the thought process of what they're trying to aspire to do. That's incredibly destabilizing, incredibly destabilizing. All of the things and the basic venues by which we have cr calculated stability start to get broken. 
and, and so how we enter into that phase, um, not, not will we, we will. The question mm -hmm. is how will we do it and under what constructs and will policy be relevant ahead of the game to start thinking about it or will it be reactive, which like many things is the case mm -hmm. normally, um, is gonna be a big challenge. So I think what I'm hearing from you is technology is going to disrupt the nuclear and missile defense balance in the same way it's disrupting other uh, yeah. aspects of, our, of, of what we understand and, and are familiar with. This also strikes me then as a major issue for the, certainly for the next administration to try to get a handle on and lead um, as it develops its, its uh, nuclear and missile defense policies. I did want to come back to you on one piece of that, and you said they're not, in the, they're not proven yet, but I, I know there's a, um, a capability deployed now in, in the Pacific on the USS Ponce. Is that sort of the basic foundation for what you're talking about, and, and what capability is that, and uh, is that, is that going to grow into, something you're, into what you're discussing? Well, this is a directed energy capability. And, and the thought process really is, um, in the early stages of this kind of capability, it's not, okay, let's get rid of all of our kinetic rounds and we're going to convert to directed energy. That's not the thought process. The thought process right now is, even at these early stages with energy management in directed energy and, and other technologies associated with it, can I address 10 or 20 percent of the target set? If I can, the implications of not shooting a $100,000 round at a soft skin motorboat, um, you know, starts to make sense. And when you're worried about the threat which is starting to emerge out there of swarms, whether they be in the air or on the, in, on the ground or the mm -hmm. sea, you now have something that can get at some percentage of that target set. And then with technology, with resources entered into that technology area, because of success, you start to constantly improve. And the upside potential of non-kinetic rounds is far more significant than the upside potential of kinetic rounds, you know, um, powered, boost powered, things like that. And so it's just an area, it's just starting. And you can see that, you can see it in directed energy, you can see it in the rail gun, you're now starting to see it in um, cyber. You know, those threat, those capabilities out there, both threat and, and, uh, and response, um, are going to happen, but they're going to happen incrementally, likely, for some period of time. I see. And some of this was addressed in an Atlanta Council report last year by Bob Manning on the future of extended deterrence in Asia, again, seeing this as a coming wave that policymakers need to, um, need to get a handle on. Um, two other questions, and then I'd, I'd, I'd love to uh, open this up, and, and uh, when we do, please uh, signal me, and, uh, and we'll bring a microphone to you. The two other questions. Uh, I can't have you on a stage and not talk about cyber. Um, and so, it, you know, cyber, it seems like every day goes by, there's a new disruption, a new um, uh, uh, espionage, Cyber Espionage Act, um, or some other new uh, cyber malicious activity. What's your sense of the current cyber threat to missile defense, and how might that evolve in the, in the next five or ten years? Um. I think right now cyber's maturity in, in general terms is the, the power and the capability that cyber has demonstrated is to undermine confidence. It's not to take down the entire electric grid or the entire banking system. It's really more about if I make one or two of those fail locally, the confidence that it would be worse um, you know, is undermined. The confidence in those who govern and are supposed to protect you from these things is undermined. And, and if you look at um, Arab Spring, the ability to use that venue, that domain of cyber, to influence people has been significant. It is not yet moving into the destructive phase, let's call it, where people uh, are killed, et cetera. Um, you know, and that will be a big step. But like the, the rail gun or like the directed energy, it's found a niche, and its niche is undermining the confidence of, of people and governance structures, et cetera, um, uh, monetary systems, et cetera. And so it's not in the total destruction of them. I mean, God forbid that we're in the dark for a day or two. You know, it, 
it's, it's really about undermining your confidence in an institution or a government. Um, it will move out of that at some point. When you talk about it in terms of missile defense, you know, again, the question is, um, uh, we have left, what we call left and right, or what I call left and right of boom. Those things that happen before you ever even get to launch something and those things that happen after. Um, cyber probably has a role on both sides, which is unique. And cyber probably has a role in that it has what are called, what was attractive, um, certainly when I was a commander of STRATCOM, is it has what's called graduated effect. You know, everything from I can influence you to I can, you know, disrupt you to maybe potentially destroy you at some point in time. And so the question of how it matures vis-a-vis -vis mil, uh, missile defense, particularly people are interested in what are, what's called right of boom, mm -hmm. before the thing ever even gets off the ground. Um, and then what can you do in a defensive way to protect yourself against that capability? And that will be a game, just like all uh, game is probably a too loose a term. It will be a contest between offense and defense that will constantly require resource. I see. And then my last question, um, and I think you uh, referred to it as well, uh, but it seems to be uh, a growing phenomenon of non-state actors using ballistic missiles. Um, and, and how should we think about this trend? Um, should, you know, are, should we be worried at all about ISIS using uh, short-range missiles or, or what have you? Um, and then uh, there are some questions about rudimentary missile defenses you know, being relatively easy to use by non-experts, and obviously we're not talking about the, the big high altitude systems, but others, and how to, should we even bother to think about that too? So basically, what's the non-state piece of this equation, uh, and is it something we should start thinking about so we're not surprised? Um, the, throughout warfare, the number one killer has been mortars, ballistic, shells launched at your adversary by state, nation states and non-nation states. That drove Israel to Iron Dome. Um, it's dri driven other countries to various capabilities that they have fielded. Um, none, you know, the problem with it is, and, and why it's been good, is just like the IED. It's so cheap to make and the counter is so expensive. And so they, they impose significant costs on your on monetary side, they impose significant costs on the life side, and they impose significant costs on the governance side. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how do you start to think about working against those types of activities? And the only way people can see right now, quite frankly, is, and it's just not ready, but is to, Iron Dome is a way that you're forced to do it and imposes significant cost on a country. Things like directed energy in that activity or railgun, which railgun isn't really at least thought of today as intercepting the round. It's more about getting to the launch point before the launch point can leave. And, and so technologies at the high end today are going to look at that. But, but like cyber, if it's really as leveraging as we think it will be, the question is, can everybody have it? Will they get it at some level? What will be the implications of that? But you, you absolutely have to look at the proliferation that's different from 10 years ago is that the rockets have become the weapon of choice yeah. because they scare the bejesus out of you, they destroy things, they leave visual signatures. Yeah. And if you can't get back to the rocket launch site, you really, for a cheap price, you're really disadvantaged. And, and we're seeing that all over the world. Great, well, thank you very much. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, I'd love to open this up now um, to the audience. So um, we will have microphones um, being run around. So please just signal. I have a question here in the third row. And if you could please identify yourself as you're asking your succinct question, that would be useful too. <laughs> uh, good morning, Wayne Meeks. I'm a defense consultant. Um, could you say a few words, General, about uh, how to manage the, uh, the resource investment between the means we currently have available, which are admittedly expensive, maybe too expensive, and the technologies that aren't quite ready yet. How, how do we turn that corner uh, and protect ourselves through the transition? Thank yeah. you. Um, 
the, the good news, I guess, is, I mean, uh, directed energy has been just around the corner since I was 10 years old. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and true of a lot of these others, they're not new. Uh, but the investment that's gone with them has been relatively minimal. Um, the utility of them has not risen to a level in many cases where they could generate investment. You're seeing that change in directed energy. Um, there are two kind of competing paths in, you know, in technology that ought to be allowed to compete and, 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 and work their way forward. Uh, you're seeing certainly um, the proliferation of resources, not necessarily government resources going towards cyber. Um, you know, and, and because of those resources, the sophistication and the speed of change is, is pretty high. Um, uh, EMP probably not as much, but, but is definitely starting to uh, gain traction. And the rail gun the same way. So, so the question is, in your offset strategy, this has been the recommendation of numerous panels, science panels, the National Defense Policy or National Defense uh, policy board channel side of the equation, et cetera. And so the recommendations are there. They're seen as being um, useful and having utility, but they're also seen as I need it to be the size of a bread box, and today it's the size of a box car. And, and you've got to start to get it down to manufacturable, um, cost-efficient uh, technologies and manufacturing processes to get us there. Uh, that. That likely is happening. It's certainly changing the face of a lot of what we do. Um, and there are commercial side applications to these activities and spin-offs that are also generating resource and investment in the R&D side because they're showing commercial application, whether it be in the cyber side or the directed energy side, et cetera. And so you know, I, my sense is the department is trying to figure out how to rechannel and take us from this will be a little bit controversial, but it's the reality. Platforms are no longer the, the coin of the realm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it used to be if we had a problem as a country, we built a platform to fix it. Today, you can't wait 15 years to build a platform to fix the problem. And so these types of modular weapons capabilities, uh, fires capabilities, sensor capabilities are becoming more and more important as the platform becomes less and less important. Doesn't mean we'll ever stop building platforms. That's not the point. But the, the, the competitive advantage is seen in the systems, quite frankly, not in the platforms. Great, thank you. Other questions? Um, Ian Brzezinski in the second row. Hi, Ian Brzezinski from the Atlantic Council. General Cartwright, I was struck by your comments on the need to include and start including missile defense and the concept of extended deterrence. I was wondering what would be the cost and burden sharing implications of that? Because when I think of extended deterrence, I think of in Cold War terms, nuclear weapons, the United States having a nuclear arsenal that it uses to defend not just itself, but also the interests and territory of, of its allies and partners. But missile defense could be extremely expensive uh, particularly in light of the technologies and missiles that you, you describe. So where would the burden of missile defense fall in extended deterrence? Is it something that we could afford, or is it something that we have to expect our allies actually to cover? Um, <clears throat> I think when you, when you think of extended deterrence in the classic Cold War construct, it was a construct in which you said to your friends, you don't need to spend the money and develop this. We'll do it for you, and we'll be there for you. Okay. So that was uh, we're going to we're going to build it, we're going to buy it, and we're going to field it and operate it for another country. Okay. In this construct of extended deterrence, what you're thinking more about is we have some technologies and capabilities. We're willing to share them. Countries, because of the local imperative of life, etc., feel more threatened and they're more willing to put resource to it as long as it's not about something that might come in 20 years. In other words, the Iron Dome capability, whatever, the Patriots, etc. And so you're finding a much more robust burden sharing equation in, in this vision of extended deterrence. 
number one. And number two, it doesn't mean you have to buy only American. The system was specifically designed to incorporate either new or other capabilities developed in other places. So the intermixing of, of systems, you know, which is really where the power has been in, in missile defense, is now giving you an opportunity to say, not only do you, do you not have to buy just American, but you can go out and start to innovate and actually either try to get ahead of, provide competitive ideas for. I mean, some of the best directed energy technologies are not occurring in the United States by a long shot. And so this has opened it up and competition in this area, in this kind of concept of extended deterrence has actually enriched the activity more than, than anything else. So it's a, it is a fundamental departure from I'll build it, I'll buy it, and I'll operate it, trust me, to I'll build, I'll offer you opportunities, you can build, we can incorporate it together, um, and it's something that you can go out in your backyard and pet and say, okay, it's mine, it's here, <laughs> I know it's here, see people, it's here. Um, you know, it has, a, I mean, it's a fundamentally different way to look at deterrence and a fundamentally w different way to think about burden sharing uh, mm -hmm. and cost sharing. And so there's a range, I think, in that regard, it's interesting to think of the U.S. and Japan where there's co-development of a common system and then the NATO alliance where there's different systems uh, Integra integrated in. Yeah, integrated in. And still uh, all contributing to the overall. I think right now where we're seeing the greatest diversity in systems is at the lower end against the in close threats. Um, you know, whether it's the, you know, the new uh, extended range AMRAM or similar types of rounds that are being built by other companies, you know, in the consortium. But this idea, you know, that, that Iron Dome initially um, uh, addressed but of threats that are more like cruise missiles, airplanes, uh, short range kinetic rounds, et cetera, are being addressed. And the technologies, because they're very real threats to many countries, money and dollars are being pushed on those technologies right now. General Carter, you mentioned cruise missiles, and I, I, wanted, I wanted to follow up on that. There was a, there was a piece in the press uh, within the last couple of weeks on the cruise missile threat presented by Russia to the United States and to the homeland. Um, and I know um, it's been a problem that uh, technologists and to, to an extent policymakers have been looking at for quite a while as well, but what's your sense of how cruise missiles fit into the missile defense equation, both regionally as well as regarding uh, uh, defense of the United States itself? Um, if, if, you, if you go back, um, you know, part of the, the key reason that we went with cruise missiles, you know, there were a couple of reasons. One was the standoff range. So then I didn't have to give the platform all of the characteristics of survivability and whatnot mm -hmm. to get to the target. I could do that on a smaller um, vehicle. Um, that also gave us a way to address things like anti-aircraft, uh, surface-to-air missiles, and guns, etc. It was a, a cheap way to go after those, uh, particularly in the area concept uh, of a Cold War. Um, today, those missiles are still being used. Uh, they're proliferated around the world um, to a large extent, but the, th the thought process, you know, with them is, one, they're, you know, even in your best day of reducing price, you're still a half a million dollars a shot, okay? And um, it takes at least, I don't know, half hour, hour to get to the target, and if, I'm the target. If I decide to get up and stretch and walk away, I'm safe. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, it's just a, it's it's that problem. And so, what has fundamentally started to change the game and brought interest back to cruise missiles is hypersonics, mm -hmm. and the potential of moving these things at very high speeds um, across distances, such that the time from flash to bang is much shorter, um, and that speed and agility along with other survivability attributes that countries are putting on makes it a, a more difficult target, okay? Um, and so it's gotten interest again. And you know, every time we build an airplane, um, a bomber or something like that, then the question is, okay, how much survivability on the platform? How much survivability on the missile? 
how do I do this? How do I start to think about that? What's the trade-off in the equations? And hypersonics is starting to alter that equation again and make, make, make for a good debate. Um, but I think that's, that's one of the key worries here is that the introduction of hypersonics to cruise missiles has, has made them an interesting target. Um, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, hypersonics is not free. <laughs> It's extremely expensive and it takes a lot of energy, mm -hmm. particularly if you want to go long distances. If you're only going 500 miles, going at Mach 5 mm -hmm. versus Mach 1, you know, is a few seconds. I mean, it's not a big deal. You've got to really reach out to make it worth the investment, and that takes a lot of fuel, and then you start building these behemoth things. And so mm -hmm. there's a trade here that's going on that has changed, it's been altered a little bit, but it still has some of the, the characteristics it's always had. But that, that's really the, in my mind, that's the focus right now that have made cruise missiles reemerge uh, as, as an area of, of interest. I see. Other questions from the audience? Yes, over here. Morning, John Cartwright. Uh, Herb Kemp from One Alpha Corporation. Uh, at this and other conferences, we spend an enormous amount of time talking about the defense of battle, but you alluded to left of launch. Should we be placing more of our R&D efforts left of launch? And if so, can you discuss that to any degree? Um, there's a great interest in being left of launch, left to boom, um, uh, for a lot of reasons. The difficulty in the discussion is the discussion of preemptive. Um, you know, and legitimacy for doing that and, and, and the ability to build a case. Um, in war, it's not, a, it's not hard, but in what we're seeing ourselves in most often, we're not in a full state of war, and so a preemptive attack oftentimes is difficult to justify. But getting past that and looking at how you can start to think about it, again, I think the characteristics that are most important left of launch are the are the characteristics of, um, of a graduated effect. In other words, do I want to just make you lose confidence in your system over time? Do I want to go further and have it malfunction a lot? Do I want it to blow up in place, you know, et cetera? And so looking at all of those areas and giving the National Command Authority a menu that is something other than just boom, um, has, has really become attractive because every one of these scenarios is different and your objective for why you're doing the attack changes and so you want to be able to match the objective so that you compel your adversary to do what it is you want them to do, not entice them to do something you never wanted them to do like attack. And so, you know, that's why left of bang is really useful from a national you know, national authority standpoint is it gives a, the, the national command authority far greater menu for the purposes that they might actually run into than working on the other side when something is launched and now you're into self-defense or whatever it is and you really haven't had a chance to negotiate your way to that point. You've lost a lot of steps. Great. Thank you, General. Other questions? Um, yes, we have two in the front row. We'll take one at a time. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, I'm Felipe Rodriguez, intern at the Aerospace Industries Association. You mentioned new technologies such as directed energy and rail guns, but what is the strategy for their implementation across the spectrum of projectile threats ranging from rockets to nuke carrying ICBMs? Um, I think you know, the implementation strategy, the thought process is that you start at a rudimentary level, um, demonstrate that the technology has some reasonable ability to address the problems that you have and envision you're going to have. Um, uh, and then almost always with any kind of weapon, it starts out at a small target set that it's able to address. And as you get experience, and as it shows promise, it'll either gain investment or it'll be discarded, um, you know, proven that it can't do it. Or what you see oftentimes is it's discarded for some period of time, and then computational power, energy management, with something else, a breakthrough occurs in another area, and now it's interesting again, you know, and you start to, to pull it along. And so with directed energy, we kind of went to the extreme 
of what we could do, but it wasn't enough and it wasn't, it was viewed as not being tactically useful at that, in that stage. We waited a little while. Now there have been some breakthroughs, technology, et cetera, that have made it more interesting again, and we're starting to come back to it. And we're there at a point now where it's sufficient that it's not just on a test platform. It's been deployed to see now what's it useful for, how do I integrate it into my fires, when would I use it, under what circumstances, what is it useful for, and is that going to show sufficient value, um, particularly when you in integrate um, fires onto a ship, trying to coordinate sensors and everything while you're rolling, <laughs> you know, and think pointing algorithms, all of those things become really difficult. And if you can do it there, I don't want to say land is easy, but, but you know, you, you really start to prove out technologies. And so this is, this is one of those that, okay, it wasn't ready, we put it on the shelf for a while, now it's come back. Um, and you'll often see that in the life cycle of, of bringing a new technology on. Yes, and we had a question here. General, I'm Fritz Plöger, former Deputy Commander of Aircom Rammstein. Uh, I have a comment and a question. I would start with a comment. Uh, when we talk about ballistic missile defense, and uh, we uh, normally did it in a holistic view, the offensive element is part of ballistic missile defense. So uh, it is, <clears throat> uh, in concerning deterrence, it's both defensive capabilities as well as a combination with offensive capabilities. Otherwise, it won't work in the long run. Uh, and in that context, we should not forget about that portion right of launch that is passive defense. That yeah. also needs to be included. Uh, my question is, uh, when you look at uh, <clears throat> use of ballistic missile capabilities or ballistic capabilities, uh, rockets, mortars uh, in uh, the Middle East, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, during the last Gaza war, the uh, Hamas fired about uh, 3,000 something rockets into Israel and achieved only one single casualty. And that has, uh, let's say, pr <clears throat> proven the capability of the Iron Dome system increasing in the effectiveness by a factor of 10 over time. So initially it was 300 or so for a casualty. Now, where do you see a lever we could have on non-state actors? You see the Hamas is probably no effect at all. They see the offensive reaction, but still, where do you see a lever? Um, in, in, in your comment, I, I couldn't agree more. The, the question that we're trying to understand is we were basically, particularly in the Cold War uh, in this area, in a um, offense only. And you, offense only is probably better than defense only, but a balance is always going to put you in a better place and give, your, give you more options. And playing that balance and how it works is always a strategy game that, that we have to work our way through. Um, as you look at the mortars, the missiles, the uh, capabilities that non-nation state actors are now starting to be able to field, um, you know, normally the way we have handled non-state actors is to impose cost and drive them out of the game. Okay? We create an exquisite version of whatever it is they do. So we create Iron Dome. It's really expensive, but it, it does the job for a period of time. And it gives us an advantage. And then we put our offense to work you know, in ways that um, in, you know, basically impose uh, your will on, on the adversary. Um, the, the, the difference is now, and you can see it most strikingly in cyber, is the access to advanced technologies and the access to the capabilities and the strategies associated with advanced technologies, two trends. One, they're actually, in some cases, affordable and doable by the non-nation state, particularly in the cyber area, creating their own viruses, et cetera. And then when you look at the rockets and mortars and things like that, and you look at cyber, you're starting to see this is a little bit controversial, but you're starting to see third parties provide non-nation states with capabilities that have a certain set of keys associated with them. I'll give you this, and I'll give you X number of rounds for you to do what you decide you want to do with them. 
Um, I can do that in cyber. I can do that with ballistic rockets and, and things like that. And you're starting to see more and more of that. So who's the, who are you trying to deter and are you actually getting and deterring the person who is providing or the person who's pulling the trigger or both ideally? And is your deterrent structure thinking that way or is it just thinking about defeating one rocket at a time? Um, you know, and I think in many cases we're, we're forced into thinking about one rocket at a time, but the longer term strategy has to think about who's providing these capabilities, what's the underlying construct that resources them, resources the technologies, and how do you start to get at that issue? Very interesting. I mean, what I'm taking away from this conversation may be the suggestion, this overall conversation, may be the suggestion that uh, def the defense-offense balance may be shifting, and we may be coming to a point in the next decade where defenses may be as capable as offenses. In I think, as ways, you said, defense is never a shield. It, it, it can't be. You know, and any expectation that it's a shield is, is a false expectation. They will change the calculus of yes. your adversary on whether they're willing to attack, potentially, but it is not a shield. Never 100%. Never 100%. Yeah. Great. Other questions? Good. I have one about Asia, and then I'll let you go. <laughs> how, how do we think about, um, and this will pre preview the panel coming up later today, how, how should we think about uh, missile def U.S. missile defenses uh, in Asia? And as you said, uh, certainly in the Obama administration, the sort of policy theory in Asia has been a little less developed than it was in Europe, where it was very clearly enunciated, the various steps were um, were demarcated, and the, the, the policy was pretty clear. In Asia, a little less clear. China has a strategic nuclear arsenal. We have the growing but very limited threat from North Korea. We have extended deterrence, and we're working with some of our allies on missile defenses. But how should we think about missile defense, and in particular vis-a-vis -vis China, which is a, in many ways a rising superpower? Um. A thought process of, of going at this issue would, number one, is that the, the diversity of the threat is pretty significant there. I mean, the North Korea threat is probably what started missile mm -hmm. defense and gave it ground to move. That has, you know, that is starting to take on um, a more, ever more sophistication in mobility on the ground, in mobility in the number of, of uh, missiles that North Korea has, et cetera, and the amount of time they, they farm, and the short distances they have to cover to get to their adversaries. Okay, that, that is the imperative there. It must be fast. So getting at you know, the next generation capabilities we're talking about is going to, at some point, be critical if you really want to stop these things before they're in, in and on you. Um, so there's that side of the equation. Then there is the side of the equation of uh, a regional managed activity that is denying, potentially could deny us, the opportunity to intervene um, at, a, at a significantly uh, significantly elevated technology and numbers base. Um, and how you're going to start to think about handling very survivable rounds, ballistic rounds, that what were once ballistic and are not ballistic anymore, um, sophisticated defenses and survivability techniques, and a proliferation over a very large area. So in other words, China's a large country. It can basically, um, trying to go find things like this is going to be difficult. And if you, if you are in a skirmish, um, do you really want to shoot at China's mainland? That um, will be a big policy decision in that discussion in, in, in crisis. And how do you start to think your way through that? Um, what are the geographic, um, geometric um, looks that you can get from sensors and weapons, and et cetera? And so mobile systems, which are in and of themselves significantly more expensive than fixed systems, become a large part of your calculus. It'll cost us more to do this um, because you won't have as many fixed sites that are as effective. And and that mobility has to survive. And so you're really starting to work at a very different, 
very difficult equation, and this is the Monday morning after. Everybody's got our playbook, okay? They're just building to our playbook right now. And the question is, can you get disruptive enough mm -hmm. to make them uncomfortable even though they've got the playbook? Uh, I mean, that, that, at the end of the day, is the hard part here. Um, as, as much as I you know, would like to believe it, 2,000 Marines and four LCS will not change the <laughs> equation. It, it's, we have to start to think of how do you bring fires to the problem um, without having to have thousands of ships, et cetera, because and, and, that's not affordable. So it, it's going to look very different in my mind than the European. In Europe and the Middle East, you augment with mobile but you rely on fixed. And so, you know, this is gonna be just the opposite. You're basically going to augment probably with fixed, but you're gonna to have to rely on mobile. I see, very, very interesting. Well, I've taken General Cartwright, or he's taken us for in almost every region of the world and back in time as well as forward in time. And so uh, a very rich conversation certainly for, for me. And uh, please join me in thanking General Cartwright for this discussion. Thank you.